Good evening, Mr. President, members of the town council. Okay. In light of the uh, appropriation request tonight, I thought it would uh, benefit you all to uh, make a presentation uh, really looking at uh, the status of the Hyannis water system uh, from the past, present, and the future. I think there's a lot that's gone on over the last two years. We've worked very hard to manage a very difficult situation with the identification uh, of uh, contaminants of emerging con concern in our water system and uh, further information that um, uh, when the EPA dropped the levels uh, made the situation even more difficult. So um, with that. So basically, these are, these are the items we're going to touch on. I'm going to uh, look at our water demand, the existing supply, uh, what the contaminants are that are impacting our, our supply, and that is the issue uh, that faces us and is the most concerning. I'm going to look at uh, things we've done to date, the next steps um, in the process of providing uh, safe, adequate quantities of drinking water. I'm going to look at rate impacts and finally, uh, potential funding sources. The Hyannis water system uh, provides drinking water and water for fire flow to Hyannis, Hyannis Port, West Hyannis Port, and portions of Centerville, actually. We provide 5.5 million gallons a day, and about half of that in the winter is our uh, water demand. Right now, we can't meet that demand without supplemental water from Yarmouth, we, not even in the winter. We have 7,300 accounts, 1,500 of those are, are, are commercial customers. However, interesting to note that those 1,500 customers, the commercial customers, use a half of our water uh, that we generate annually in the Hyannis water system. So that's a very different system than the other systems in the town of Barnstable. Uh, for example, COMM has twice the number of customers, but pumps about the same amount of water. So obviously, uh, this area is important, being the uh, commercial center of the Cape, Barnstable, uh, providing water for commercial customers is a very important part of what we do. This is just uh, simple to show you here. These are the uh, break out of the water districts in the town of Barnstable and uh, Ketuit, COMM, West Barnstable, Barnstable Fire District, and Hyannis is the town water system, not a water district, but this is the service area. And West Barnstable, obviously interesting to note that uh, you see there's no uh, lines. What these are, this is a water main system, so that water district doesn't have a water system, and that relies exclusively on private wells. So this, this blows up further uh, what I just showed you, uh, looking at the Hyannis water system service area here. And you can see where our wells are located. Um, and these are the areas, Mary Dunn, four wells in the Mary Dunn um, well field, which is off Mary Dunn Road, airport well, which is on airport property, the Mar well field, which is off Old Yarmouth Road in um, Hyannis. And then we have wells down in the southern portion of the service area, straightway wells, and then Hyannis Port and Simmons Pond. So this is uh, where we get into the, the real seriousness of the situation. Uh, on this chart here, you can see the listing of the wells. And we have 12 wells uh, in the system. And uh, they're listed here. And you can see uh, this is the million gallons per day that they can generate when they're at their full, full yield. And then these are the contaminant impacts. You can see that um, there's really no well here uh, that, that has no impact uh, from some type of contaminant. Uh, last year at this time, uh, PFOS only affected two wells, Mary Dunn 1 and 2. When the EPA dropped the standard on May 16th from uh, 0.2 parts per billion down to 0.07 parts per billion, uh, that 
rendered these other wells, the third well and Mary Dunn, and then the Mar wells um, problematic with PFOS and PFOA. And you can see uh, additionally here the Mary Dunn well four, Mary Dunn well number four has not been used because it's under the influence of surface water. Airport well has high iron and manganese, uh, which is really a uh, more an aesthetic issue, uh, but it does cause issues uh, with the customers. And Hyannisport has nitrate. That's likely from uh, groundwater that's been impacted by the wastewater treatment plant over the years. And I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little more detail in a moment. Straightway one is capped. Straightway two is affected by 1,4-dioxane and manganese. And then you can see here our other water sources currently are the Yarmouth interconnect. Um, issues with that is it's very expensive and we have no control on the quantity. We're restricted as to what we can use and when we can use the water. And that's the same issue uh, with COMM, although the price of the water from COMM is uh, more affordable uh, to us than the, than the uh, Yarmouth water. So I just want to briefly talk about the, con the contaminants, uh, where they come from, some you know, particular notes about each of them. The most important and the one that's most impacting us being the PFOS, PFOA. And I just mentioned a moment ago where the um, health advisory that was issued by the EPA uh, is down to 0.07 parts per billion for PFOS or 0.07 parts per billion for PFOS and PFOA combined. These are perfluorinated compounds that um, they come from firefighting foam, flame retardants. Uh, they're also in uh, heat resistant materials, nonstick cookware, many things, consumer products include PFOS and PFOA. And these are generally of the category considered con contaminants of emerging concern which basically means that the EPA every year is looking at more and more chemicals as they start looking at the environmental and public health impacts of these chemicals. Um, they're starting to set standards and ultimately they'll move from health advisories to goals to finally standards. And we have that in all the, in the Mary Dunn one through three wells. Uh, we're not using well number four, so we're not sure if that's there yet. And the MAR, uh, one, two, three wells, which is all the wells in the MAR field. We have um, iron and manganese issues. Basically, these are naturally, naturally occurring in the environment, particularly in the geology that we have here in Cape Cod. And um, these are aesthetically a problem. And basically, when you expose the iron and manganese that's in the water to oxygen, uh, you basically get precipitates out, and so it becomes a solid. So it's, it's oxidized. And so that's a problem uh, within the water itself. You get a glass of water, you get iron in there, and it stains your clothes and whatnot. But also, it fouls treatment equipment. So that's important to remember. In a few minutes, I'll be talking more about that. 1,4-dioxane is another contaminant of emerging concern. And we have this in, in a number of wells, uh, the Mar, Straightway, Simmons Pond, Hyannis Port Wells. This has become a very ubiquitous contaminant throughout the country because it's in so many consumer products, um, shampoos and cosmetics. It's also in um, paint strippers and greases and dyes and lots of things that not only are used in industry, but all of us use uh, in one way or another every day. And so a lot of this is getting into our groundwater system through septic systems, uh, through improper disposal, but also through industrial uses. So actually, I, I was thinking about the PFOS, PFOA, this 0.07 parts per billion, to try to put that into some, some context. And um, years ago when I would do this to try to you know, use a swimming pool analogy, how much of this is a contaminant? And this is, I haven't done it in a long time, but this is amazing when you get down to 0.07 parts per billion, which is really parts per trillion. So if you were to fill a Olympic-sized swimming pool, we can picture that big swimming pool. If you were to fill that with an with an eyedropper, one drop at a time, you would have to fill a hundred Olympic swimming pools with an eyedropper, and if one drop in those hundred swimming pools had PFOS in it at this level, all that water would be contaminated. 
It's just an amazing amount of water that's contaminated by such a small amount, which shows you the, the powerful effects to public health of these contaminants, that such small amounts can have drastic impacts over a lifetime of use. I mentioned the nitrates. We have nitrates in the straightway wells. Uh, there is a state standard for that. It's 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, Hyannis Port has it about half that. We've been monitoring that for a number of years, and it pretty much stays at that level. We don't see it rising. Um, that's something that can be treated, um, but at this point, uh, it's not necessary to do that. And uh, we also have lesser levels in the other wells, which are down gradient of the one with the 4 to 5 milligrams per liter. Perchlorate is previously an issue in the Mary Dunn wells as a result of some industrial contamination up um, in the industrial park. That was remediated. Um, there's still some in the groundwater, but it's below any level that needs to take action or be treated. And then finally, uh, VOC, which is volatile organic compounds. Uh, this contamination comes from the Hyannis area uh, in and around the airport, upgrading of the airport. Uh, was the original source, and we've had a, an air stripper there installed on our mar wells for a number of years. And basically, when you blow air through um, water that's contaminated with volatiles, the volatiles volatilize, and then you capture them, and that cleans the water. And then finally, and it's kind of an unknown, is contaminants of emergent concern. We have a list now. They keep coming out with new rules and new lists. They're already upgrading. They're calling it the, uh, the UCMJ. Uh, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule number four, which we're going to see soon, which is going to give us a host more chemicals that they're going to require treatment for. What, I don't even know what the list is, so I don't know whether or not we're going to have them. So what have we done to date on the contaminants that I just addressed and where we've known about them? So we started this, really started identifying the PFOS at the end of 2014 and working with the EPA and the DEP, the requirement to treat uh, became real, and we did that starting in 2015. So we installed carbon treatment systems on Mary, Del Mary Dunn 1 and 2 in 2015. And then last year, when the standard dropped, we uh, added an additional treatment system for Mary Dunn 3. So all of our active Mary Dunn wells are now treated with the carbon systems. You can see the, the photograph here. This is what they look like. And uh, this fall, we put them in buildings, as you may recall, an appropriation for that. And the reason we did that was because of the increased contamination at the Mar well field, we didn't have enough water in the winter. So put, putting these in buildings allows us to heat those buildings and keep the water flowing throughout the year. We established an interconnection with the town of Yarmouth. First, we had a temporary that we used for two years. We've now installed a permanent interconnection that we can use uh, and as well as Yarmouth can use. And we have an agreement with the town of Yarmouth for that. We've installed a temporary connection with COMM over on uh, Finney's Lane. You can see the photograph here on the bottom right. This is our temporary interconnection. It has all the testing equipment, uh, the uh, chemical treatment, and heat so that we can run that in the winter. And we have two engineering studies underway uh, looking at potential source options. One is basically looking at the overall system to try to identify for decades ahead what is going to be our means of providing water to this service area. And that could be anything from continuing treatment on some wells and relocating wells uh, to other places in, within the district or within the town. Uh, we have also, which is really the subject to, of tonight's meeting, an appropriation request. We have a, had a study to look at the MAR treatment wells and what we need to do there to treat those and get those back online and stop relying on the Yarmouth water. This is just uh, these next couple of slides called limitations, uh, constraints, issues to consider. Just as we go through this analysis of what to do, uh, for the future, some things to consider. Um, basically, there's no single solution. We can't just put carbon on all the wells because carbon doesn't treat all the contaminants. So that's why on MAR, we have this approach tonight. We're doing a different 
uh, treatment system for the different contaminants. So we, we basically end up with what's called a treatment train. So you put one process after another and you design that. So we have VOC removal right now at MAR. We're going to be adding carbon and potentially adding an oxidation process to take out the 1,4-dioxane. So there's no, no, no one answer, no silver bullet. Uh, new contaminants I mentioned a moment ago, the contaminant of emergent concern regulations. We don't know what's coming down the road, except I do know there's going to be more contaminants to look for in an industrialized area. You're quite likely going to find some of them. Whether they exceed the standards, it remains to be seen. We'll just have to play that as it comes. Um, control of the water source. This, these next two really relate to, well, th this one in particular, when we're buying water from another community or water system, it's not our water, and we're, we're constrained by the agreement. Time of day, uh, basically, they don't want us to pump water at a certain time because that's when they want to pump their water, but it's when we need it too. You know, and usually that's done in the middle of the night, but a lot of the, a lot of the irrigation systems are going then, so we're all trying to fill our water tanks in the middle of the night, so they don't want us to do that. And uh, so we, we don't have control. They can turn it off pretty much in a moment's notice. If they have a problem in their wells, they're not going to keep providing water to us. So those agreements basically allow them to turn that water off with some notice. And then blending. This is the uh, process whereby we can bring clean water in and blend it with some low contaminant water. Uh, and basically, as long as you're keeping below the standard in the system, that satisfies the DEP. Uh, you know, I generally recommend we don't do that. I think our goal has been, this town has shown that you know, they're going, th that we treat the water, that we, we treat and remo remove the contaminants. Um, we're doing this now, however, with 1,4-dioxane uh, treated uh, at the MAR site with water from Yarmouth. This is the, generally, the time frame for getting new wells online, if we were to try to get new sources, and it's a very lengthy and complicated process which involves lots of testing and permitting uh, and design and construction and generally speaking in our experience and the experience in the DEP is to start from scratch to develop new water sources. You're talking about a five-year process. So next steps, what are we doing um, now and into the future? I mentioned two wells that we're not using. One is the straightway well, straightway one. That's a well that was capped in the 1980s. It had some issues with odor. And uh, we're investigating, and we've done some testing there, and that issue doesn't appear to be there. Uh, it's at a different uh, level in the groundwater than our other straightway well. So our goal is to try to get this well and the Mary Dunn 4 well back online. It's obviously much cheaper to bring wells back online than to drill new wells, and we can do it in a much shorter time frame because a lot of the permitting's already been done. So we're looking at that right now. Providing treatment at Mara Well Field, which we'll be talking about in the next couple of slides, and then finally finding long-term sources of unimpacted water in the High Ennis area. Um, study for newer sources is underway. We've awarded a contract to do that, uh, and as I mentioned, that, that's a lengthy, lengthy process. So for the MAR, this is basically 30 percent of our total water production capability, which is a significant amount of our uh, water, and it's all of those wells are impacted, uh, as I've shown in slides uh, earlier. And right now, to take blend water from Yarmouth, to buy water from Yarmouth, we're looking at about a million gallons per day at the height of use, and that cost is $3.52 per thousand gallons. And we are spending, planning, and budgeting a little over a million dollars a year for this year and next uh, for that water. The MAR proposal basically is two phases of work. And the first phase of which we're discussing tonight is the $6.5 million, which is for carbon treatment system on the MAR wells and a pilot testing for the second phase of the project. And the second phase is treating for the 1,4-dioxane. And we need to do a pilot test to understand how we'll be able to treat that water um, given 
the geologic conditions, the water quality, the fact that we have VOCs there. We have iron and manganese. We need to understand if iron and manganese are going to be problematic for that system or whether we need to add a green sand component, which will take out the iron and manganese prior to. So that pilot test will occur uh, first over this ne over the summer and fall. And we're proposing to uh, bring the carbon treatment systems on the Marwell field. They'll be installed in a building. That building will have space to accommodate a 1,4 dioxane treatment system uh, in, the, in the future, whether or not that's with the, the green sand filtration or not. Uh, that treatment system, the carbon, will be brought online uh, in May 2010. And then after we do the pilot testing for phase two, uh, the schedule calls for that being brought online uh, and, and becoming completely off Yarmouth water in May of 2019. Just want to give you a sense of the impacts to rates of these kind of capital expenditures. Now, a couple of qualifications here. This is based on all things being equal. So um, moving ahead as we have, and we've had a robust capital program to upgrade this water system since 2007. Now, given these kind of numbers, we may need to look at seriously curtailing some aspects of that and focus on these treatment systems uh, right now. Just to give you a sense for water rates and what people pay for water on the Cape, we've done a survey um, of, of Cape water suppliers. And uh, basically, the cost of our water is right about in the middle. Uh, if you do a statistical analysis and look at a bell curve, we're in the middle of that, that bell curve. More specifically in numbers, if you look at the annual consumption of water, average annual nationwide, they usually look at 90,000 uh, CCF or 100 cubic feet per year. So in, in our Hyannis water system, that costs $396. The range of water systems on the Cape range from $150 to $660. The medium cost is $405, and the average is $360. So you can see we're right at the median, and we're a little above average. That's currently. So I think in looking at this, and these are the options I just talked about on the left, you see no action, carbon filters only, carbon uh, filters and uh, the UV for the 14 dioxane, and then finally, if we have to add the green sand filters. And, I th and if you look at this over five years, when the rates start to normalize again, because other, other debt's being retired, um, you can see that the costs are pretty much the same over that five-year period uh, as far as rate increases. And I think a good analogy is that um, it's kind of comparing renting a car to buying it. So for Relying on Yarmouth water, that's like renting a car. We're just going to pay a million bucks a year and keep doing that. Uh, but after five years, uh, if we build these other systems and they look about the same, regardless of the choice chose, uh, you then have a system, you're completely off Yarmouth, uh, and you have that's going to be operational for the next 30 years, given appropriate operation and maintenance. So funding. One of the main sources of funding these water projects is a state revolving fund, state revolving loan fund, and that's a program that we've used many times in the past, and we've made applications for emergency funding and for standard uh, funding through uh, the Clean Water Trust, who manages that program uh, in the Commonwealth. The SRF is generally a 2% loan program, however, uh, the value, because sometimes we can do better than that in the market, but the real value of the SRF program is that they have options for 0% loans. Now, they don't currently fund that. Um, the legislature has the ability to do it, but they have not funded that program. If they fund that program, there may be zero loan fund loans available. And then also, we're eligible under the SRF program for principal forgiveness. And we've gotten that in the past. Typically, they're 2%, 3%, uh, but anything is helpful. But they could be more, depending on the year. And unless you um, 
uh, unless you participate, you're not going to be eligible. So we want to set ourselves in a position to be eligible to offset some of these costs that I've been talking about and rate increases uh, with principal forgiveness. Now, one of the things that's interesting there is that calculation as to who gets rated for principal forgiveness is based on a number of things. And it used to be environmental justice issues. But, but what it is, they look at um, ability to pay within the town. So they're looking at income, they're looking at population trends, they're looking at unemployment. But we have made a case to the Clean Water Trust that they shouldn't be looking at Barnstable as the entire town. They should be looking at Barnstable as the Hyannis water system service area. And if you do the calculations based on that service area, we get we rate much higher in being able ability to get principal forgiveness. So um, they're looking over that letter and that information. I think the sense I got was they were very interested and I think willing to look at it that way. It's fair. Uh, and, and I'm hoping they do that. So that'll set us up better for principal forgiveness. The Community Preservation Act uh, through the Community Preservation Committee in town. Uh, we intend to uh, present to them a request for funding. Uh, there is the ability through CPC to fund uh, certain aspects of uh, water development uh, and water supply projects. So we're working with the chair of that to make a request there. We're going to be seeking whatever grants that are available. We haven't found any to date, but um, as you may have heard over the last few months, there's been a lot of promise of billions of dollars to water infrastructure projects. The town manager reached out to our uh, federal delegation uh, and congressman and basically uh, was told that those monies will come to the town. If they do, they'll come through that SRF program. That's what they're using to get channel the money to town. So again, we're positioning ourselves for that with our applications to them. Other opportunities to bring in extra revenue, save money. We, get a, we, uh, we currently have an uh, interim agreement with Yarmouth at that high rate that we're not happy with. Uh, I've talked to them and requested in our permanent uh, relationship that that rate be more reasonable. Uh, I, spoke, I met with the interim uh, town manager, the public works director. They seem very willing and interested to relook at their rate structure and perhaps us help us out. So we'll continue to work with them on that. And then finally, uh, as you know, obviously we've, uh, we have a lawsuit pending with Barnstable County to reimburse us. You know, right now, uh, the reason the increases are as they are is we're covering all these costs. To date, with this project, we've spent over $11 million on this pro problem. So it's, it's an enormous amount of money, and we need to get uh, some of that reimbursement back where it's appropriate. Hence, hence the lawsuit with the county, and then finally uh, the lawsuit um, with uh, 3M, who manufactures uh, the perfluorinated compounds and the uh, manufacturers and distributors of the firefighting foams. Um, that's a, a contingency-based lawsuit, no cost to us, but possibly could have rewards if they're successful, and they would go to offset uh, these costs in the water system. should be it for, as far as my presentation. I'd be happy to discuss any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this is a public hearing. Any members of the public wishing to speak? I ask that you please step forward now. Seeing none, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? All those uh, in a support of closing the public hearing. All right, Councilor discussion on this item. Councilor Cullum. Yeah, so um, as it is now, the town has been shouldering the responsibility of the cost of these, these improvements, these filters, these connections, all of this stuff. Eventually, it's all going to trickle down, pardon the pun, to the Hyannis rate pair. So I'm very concerned about how that's going to pan out. And I know that there's, um, you know, your, your list of possible um, recompenses here, and that's great. But, um, you know, you're looking at a 50% rate increase over five years for water in Hyannis when you just said the major, well, you didn't say this, but I'm, I'm intimating that Cape Cod Hospital is a major um, user of the water. There's, there's so many um, 
services that are in Hyannis that are using this water that benefit everyone in town. And I, I appreciate the angle that Hyannis has a lower socioeconomic status and therefore might be eligible for some grants and things like that. But this is really, um, this is really going to send heads reeling in the Hyannis. Um, so what do you say to your constituents? I'm not sure that I'm, I can answer that for what you say to your constituents. It's, um, you are shouldering it. I mean, you said the town's not shouldering it. I mean, the point I was going to make was because we're operating as an enterprise account, that water system has to generate revenue for all of its expenses the way it sits today. Um, and until we can get funds back from those that created this problem, which um, I hope we do, uh, then that they have to, it has to be on the rates, and that's. I mean, and, and so say we get the money back, rates then go down? Yes. I mean, we don't need as much money to operate. I've never seen a rate go down. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flores. Through the chair, thank you. Um, excellent presentation, Dan. Appreciate it greatly. Uh, just curious, uh, in terms of the um, public hearing that just closed, the six million five hundred thousand dollars that we're going to be voting on. I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that we have to approve this because water, clean water, drinkable water, whether it's in Hyannis or whatever village anyone might live in, is a fundamental right. I mean, this isn't a benefit; it's a right of us being human beings and living in a community where we deserve and expect to have clean water. So I think, in terms of voting for this. There is no alternative. I empathize with uh, Councilor Cullum in the sense that because all of this is happening within the Hyannis area, that somehow somewhere down the road, I think there needs to be some kind of approach to try to get relief from, a, from the town as a whole. Uh, because this is one of those issues that I don't see it as a village issue. I really see it as a community issue, as a town issue. Um, and so I just want to go on the record as in, in terms of, of supporting that uh, somewhere down the road. Um, as we move this forward to try to figure out what we're going to do uh, in terms of uh, overall payment. And finally, the only other question I would have is uh, CPC funds that you are going after to help support this, that supports so many projects within the town. Um, how much are you actually asking? Because that's competing against a lot of other fundamental kinds of issues that go on within the community. I don't have the dollar amount right now because we're talking to the chairman of the CPC and also to the town attorney's office to determine exactly what the eligibility is. So whatever is eligible, we will request the amount for that. Thank you. Mark, go ahead. Do you have something? Thank you. Good evening. Mark Ellis, town manager. Um, to address Councilor Cullum's question, um, for every $100,000, we put against this budget, um, it will help to mitigate about a percent in the rate to give you a feeling. So um, I think, you know, the top number for one particular effort relevant to CPC is about an $800,000 effort. So if we don't have to incur that debt and we don't have to put that against which is, uh, is being projected here as part of these percentages because it's not all uh, the the treatment that's being added, as Dan pointed out, we've been investing capital money annually in the system. Um, and so we, we're incurring that increase as part of this as well, because we can't stop everything. We've also got to rebuild a reserve within that enterprise fund, because we are going to deplete that over two years. And that's not sustainable. We need to keep a healthy amount within that reserve so that we can move forward with projects um, as we anticipate or don't anticipate them coming along. So. $100,000 equates to about a percentage. Um, if we can secure any of those funding sources that were identified, it will go directly against reductions in the rates. Now, once the rate's set for the particular period, I'd really have to talk about how to adjust then. But I, I will assure you that we run these rates every year. If we're able to find subsidies from any source, they will be put against the rates and they will reduce the rates appropriately. So that's what we will do. The calculation that we've done included everything and 
it is borne by the rates because that is the mechanism that we would first evaluate this by. And we can't run a system hoping that we get money somewhere. Um, the problem with some of the lawsuit options, I mean, we're still actively pursuing a settlement on the Mary Dunwells. When you add up what that could potentially be, that could be 4 to 5 percent reduction in the rates if we can settle that. If it goes through the legal process, I don't even believe we'd start that um, before the courts until 2019. So um, we've got a period here that even if we go that route to settle that first one, and now we're into the Marwells, and we're going through the same evaluation, and ultimately it may result in the ability to recover, um, we do have this period that we're going to have to figure out how to, how to manage these costs in a way that our customers can bear the cost and um, but still maintain a, a safe system both from uh, the, the physical uh, capital program and now this other challenge of having to deal with treating the water. Um, we do have some debt that's going to come off the books that will help us a little time out, but you know, we're really going to have to look at our 30-year our master plan, which we're a decade into, and see how well we'll be. We were, we were hoping that that would go away and we would be able to do some more aggressive uh, pipe replacement out there within our system because it's a 100-year-old system. So um, all of that's being looked at. Any savings will go back against the rates. Um, and we will continue to advise you as we progress on this. We can certainly have a discussion about other funding sources, but right now we've calculated it this way because that is the fiscal policy. But we will certainly have that discussion. Thank you, Mark, for clarifying yep. that. Uh, Council Chair Gotis. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dan. Um, just to follow up with Council Flores had to say, you know, um, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, is this going to be a general fund expenditure rather than borne by the ratepayers just for Hyannis over time? The, the, and I understand that there's, um, you know, legal action takes time, settlements possibility. But, I mean, we need to be able to think about whether or not the um, remediation that we do to take care of the contamination is borne in the general fund rather than merely by the tax, merely by the, the rate users in that, in that district. And, and, and I think we need to think about how we do that and I think that's where we're heading because it's just too much of a burden for one small portion of the town. Council Hebert. Thank you, Mr. President, and through you. So um, it, it, it's tough to come to this this point, and it's uh, premature for my thinking, but um, I have long believed that we all took an oath for this town, and you cannot separate Hyannis from this town. And every one of us tonight, we're using the water from Hyannis um, and all of our public buildings and all of our major, I think the last time I checked, uh, it was estimated 530 million dollars worth of property is owned uh, by the town, uh, but, but it's in Hyannis. And so the reality is that this conversation is more than philosophical or theo uh, theoretical. Uh, the reality is that the taxpayers of Hyannis really have the burden of, uh, besides the fire department, of the water that we all use. Every single one of us in this town use all the facilities of the village of Hyannis, and we're really a municipality. And I think that the, the day is going to come sooner rather than later that the Hyannis water system is going to become the municipal um, Bonstable system. Um, and I know that that's not the discussion that's on the table right now, but if I was um, getting my water uh, or my fire protection from the village of Hyannis, which I have COMM, -M, but I'm thrilled with that, but as a taxpayer, I'll tell you I'm willing to help out the village of Hyannis and take uh, part of the burden to make sure. So either it becomes the total general fund um, and we protect the village of Hyannis from the financial burden of this, uh, or on the, at the end it, it just doesn't work. And, and if I was living in Hyannis Village and was looking at these expenses coming up, 
I, I think I'd put my house in the market and get out. So uh, I, I want to really thank um, the, the councillors who are speaking up in that, uh, and this conversation has to go um, bigger and stronger and faster than anybody ever dreamed of. Thank you. Councillor Wallace. Yeah, this has to be borne by the rate payers in this, in this water district. Not everyone in this town uses this water. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, the, the on page two, the lower, the lower square, if you look in the upper, hand, upper left hand corner of that, di uh, of, of that map, you will see that there's not, a, there's not a single pipe there. We have water commissioners in the West Barnstable district, but we don't have any pipes and we don't have any water. We, we supply our own waters through private wells, and sometimes we have to purchase purification systems in our own homes that have to be serviced every year at a great expense. And we don't want to bear the cost of this because we're already bearing the cost of our own water. This just wouldn't be fair to make this a municipal-wide uh, expense. I think it's a bad idea, and I could never support that. Councilor Rapkosetti. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Dan, uh, for explaining a very complicated issue. Um, you know, this issue uh, has come to a head, and it makes me realize how little we do pay for our water now, uh, you know, and, and I don't use any public water. I have my own well, and I test my own well, but I know as far as water rates, uh, we have it pretty cheap around here compared to some other parts of the country. I had a couple of questions regarding the, the actual appropriation, um, the $6.5 million. Um, can you break it down as far as uh, the cost for the treatment and for the piloting? Because I see there will be a subsequent uh, appropriation coming for the treatment of the 1,4-dioxane. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and and that I see is somewhere between 2.9 million yep. and 4.9 million. Can you just break down the uh, the appropriation? Uh, well, just in the 6.5, it's almost exclusively for the carbon system, all the piping, the controls, the buildings. The pilot test is $120,000 of that. Okay, um, uh, if I may, Mr. President. Um, you know, you, you also mentioned on page three of your presentation, uh, you're talking about the contaminants that, that impact the uh, wells. And uh, Straightway 1 and 2 and Hyannis Port and Simmons Pond are all down gradient of our wastewater treatment plant. And, uh, you know, CECs are, are, are big in wastewater treatment and I know very costly to remove. What, what efforts are being done? And I also know that many of these areas uh, downgrading of the um, uh, wastewater treatment plant are sewered now. But what is being done to address the CECs within our own wastewater treatment plant, um, which uh, eventually discharges into our groundwater? Um, if you can just explain that to, to me. At this point, there hasn't been a lot done on uh, removal. I think it's a very new, um, well, it's a whole new issue, the CECs, and the industry is really trying to get its arms around dealing with it at wastewater treatment plants because some of the treatment plants, there were, and there are different methods they use and different systems, some of them treat some CECs, some of them treat others, some of them don't treat them all. They, at different levels so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the future and uh, the EPA is really driving that and, and requiring that towns look at these things and they started with doing the water supply but I understand that they're going to be doing it with the wastewater treatment plants as well and identifying them as sources and then putting in regulations as to how that's going to proceed in the future so there's not a lot of information on that right now we do have monitoring wells there as the new um, UCMR, the four comes out. Um, we will do some sampling for that as well. We don't, we're not required to do it, but we've done it actually in our monitoring wells for the UCMR three items, and they haven't been a problem um, in our sampling to date, which is good news. 
And one final question, if I may. Um, how I know uh, Calm uh, Water was recently uh, tested and released their water quality report. Um, how, how recent was Yarmouth's tested? Uh, they, they do it every year as well, and they release that same information. And it hasn't been, I haven't seen it this year yet. Okay. Thank and they've you. been, it's been fine uh, in previous years, and no, in, no indication that there's a problem coming. Thank you. I know rates were mentioned in the presentation, so I've allowed some comment, but any more comments from any councilors? I want to focus on the actual item that's in front of us. So any other councilor comments? Vice President Crocker. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and through you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Um, I guess really uh, when we're talking blended water, it makes sense that we're using Yarmouth water because we're so close to the connection in those wells. So I guess I understand it where you'd be talking about pumping from COMM, which is the other end of the Hyannis border. But one thing that pops in my mind is that um, Airport One, um, the green treatment for iron and manganese, that's not a terrible expense, is it? What, what kind of money might we be looking at to clean that up so that maybe we can use, I mean, that was a pretty big volume well at one well, time. Well, we, we actually have used it, and this year we have used it because we were required to use it. It's yeah. just historically uh, that's been an issue. It's not a major issue, but it is impacted with uh, manganese but and they, iron. But they have yeah. systems to Absolutely. clean it up. Have, have we priced that to put um, some of these filtrations to improve it? Airport One so that maybe we use Airport One instead of Yarmouth? Well, we have been using Airport One, and I think. But on a limited fact, and not to the Limited capacity. in previous years. In this past year, we've used it pretty much huh. full out. But, and we haven't looked at treatment of that, but if it continues to be a problem, I think we should. Well, I think we should focus on treatment of everything. We should right. be concerned about giving the best water quality everywhere we can. Absolutely. So I would just ask that we yep. talk about that in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other counselors? Right. I have a motion to move the question. All those in favor of moving the question? And that's unanimous. Madam Clerk, this is a roll call. Two thirds required. Councilors, Chirigotis? Yes. Crocker James? Yes. Crocker William? Yes. Hullum? Yes. Cushing? Yes. Dagwan? Yes. Flores? Yes. Rap Grissetti? Yes. Hebert? Yes. Norman? Yes. Steinhilber? Yes. Wallace? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you.